You're listening to the Happier Marriage Podcast, which is a podcast for hopeful spouses. And this is episode 16. In this episode, we're going to talk about how to start repairing your broken marriage without making matters worse. This is part three of a five-part course on Happier Marriage Secrets. This episode will only be an excerpt of day three's recording. If at, at any point you would like to access the full course, you can do so by going to kingsleygrant.com slash HMS course, as in Happier Marriage Secrets course, but it's simply kingsleygrant.com dot com slash h m s course now in this episode you'll discover your role in getting the repairing or the healing process underway for any breakage you and your spouse have experienced in the marriage because this was done with an audience you'll hear references at times as I interact with the viewers. So I just want to make sure that you are aware of that in the case that you hear that. Also, there are a couple spots where I might reference a slide, but don't worry, you'll still be able to follow along as I explain each slide. Now, here's what I would also like you to do at the end of this episode. I want you to listen, to make sure you've listened to the past two episodes of the show, which is episode 14 and 15. So you, you want to bookmark or make a point to go back and listen to those if you have not yet done so, okay? Secondly, and this is very important, make sure you subscribe to the show to make sure that you don't miss any of the future episodes that are coming out. Also leave a rating and a review of the episode. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And make sure you bookmark this podcast as your top resource for insights on having a happier marriage. And stay tuned as we unpack this episode. Hi, I'm King Grant, a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified relationship coach, and an in-demand speaker who have been married for over three decades with two adult children. I'm also the founder and CEO of Helping Families Improve, a counseling center that caters to helping families experience the life God intended for them to have. So how do we have a happier marriage where love, respect, and deep connection takes place? That's what you'll find out as you listen to the Happier Marriage Podcast. What's up, ladies and gentlemen of Happier Marriage World? I hope you're ready for another round of the Happier Marriage Podcast for hopeful spouses. This episode might trigger you because it's going to require you to do some soul searching. But that is one of the purposes of this show, right? To stir things up and then to take you in for a safe landing. So buckle up and here we go. Are you ready to heal? Are you ready to know how to heal both yourself as well as the other person, your spouse in the relationship? If you are ready for this, put hashtag ready and let me know that you're ready to heal and to offer healing to your relationship, and to your spouse. Okay, great. Ready is what I hear, so let's go. Now, as you can see in these um, arrows, it's pointing, it's pushing towards each other. And disruptive, if you remember, is pushing away from each other. There's a, a pushing away. Here, we are pushing towards each other. In, in our day number two, we find ourselves pushing away from each other, pushing away. Today, we are pushing to, towards each other. Now, as the agenda outlined, we said that there must first be a desire. You must have a desire, right? So your spouse may not have a desire right now to heal the relationship or you, but you must have a desire to want to heal yourself and the relationship, right? 
You must start with that. Why is that so important? Because if we don't identify, I mean, if we don't commit to a desire, we're never going to get what we really need. And I want to share with you and um, how this really looks and why it is so important. Now, there is a um, there is a move a, a movie or I would say a um, documentary called The Chosen. If you have not seen that, download the app called The Chosen and watch it. It's a must watch. It's incredible, right? I think they're now working on season number three, and I won't give it away and, and spoil it. Ever. I won't do that, but you've got to watch The Chosen. It is incredible. And it's an app you can download and watch at your heart's content. Now, this picture here, it may be a, a, not as... A, as uh, clear as, and it's okay, it doesn't have to be. But it's in the chosen, it's the point where, and if you are a person of the Bible, then you will understand, you remember the story. If not, it's good to hear the story because there was a man, this pool right here is called the pool of Bethesda. And, and this man, he was paralyzed for 38 years. And so there is this belief, right? It's almost like a superstitious belief that says an angel came down and would trouble or stir the water up. And the first person that got in the water would be healed, right? Someone says, yeah, great watch. That, yeah, you're right. It's a great watch. This movie, this um, documentary is a great watch. And so the story in, in the Bible says this pool, the water will be stirred and the angel will come and stir the water. Now, there's nothing that's confirmed that this was a reality. It was more a superstitious belief, and uh, the Bible doesn't mention anything about it being a true uh, encounter that that happened. But this, the belief of the people were that 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 happened. So the first person that got in the water would be healed. So Jesus came by the pool and saw this man laying there, and he asked the man a question that you would think is, you know, come on, Jesus, can't you see this man is paralyzed? But yet. Jesus asked him a question. He says, do you want to be healed? Right? So why did he ask him the question? He wanted to know if this man had a desire to be healed. Now you say he had a desire, yes, because he was by the, by the pool, so he must desire to be healed. Well, it's an assumption. He could just want to be to hang out at the pool. He could, I, mean, I don't think he did, but he could just want to hang out. But he get excused at the excuse why he was not healed. And then Jesus looked at him and says, do you want to be healed? And when the man said yes, then Jesus healed him. So why, why I say this is so important? Because you have to first have this desire to be healed. You have to want to be healed. I know some people in a relationship they want to leverage that and keep it going so they can use it as a leverage or a weapon or as an exit strategy from a relationship. So not everybody that says that are in a unhappy marriage or a marriage that could be happier really want to change it because it works for them. They get what they want. And so why would they want to change it? They will keep it going as long as they can. And that's why I say it must first start with a desire. Now, I know you're here because you have a desire and that, or you will not be here, right? So I understand that you're here for that reason. And so, but in general, I'm just speaking in general terms here. Now, healing, I mentioned, start with a desire. But then it requires two other very important variables that I believe that sometimes keeps us from being healed, keeps us from offering healing keeps us from accepting healing, and that is humility and vulnerability. Now, humility, of course, is the opposite, opposite of pride or being proud, right? And many times, especially for us guys, as husbands, what gets in the way for us is pride, ego, right? And, and so for us, we know that we have done wrong and there's some things we need to do to make the relationship, the marriage better. But our ego and our pride. Now, of course, some um, wives are also guilty of this, but I find more so it's in the the man. He is the one that tend to act to hold back because 
pride. He feels it's a sense of weakness, right? If you, became, if, you, if you act on humility or vulnerability, it's a sense of weakness and they don't want to appear weak, right? Now, does that, does that sound like something you've heard or seen or experienced or would say that to be true, right? Do you find that pride and ego does get in the way sometimes? And do you, would you agree that this tend to happen more so? And again, you're not pointing fingers. You're not throwing your husband or you're, you know, under the bus. It's just simply in general terms we're speaking about here. Do you find that tend to be one of the things that gets in the way? Pride, ego, because of what it means, you know? I'm from a culture. And if you haven't figured that out yet, I'm from a culture that is a Jamaican culture, right? It's Caribbean. Someone said here, yes, it's true. Thank you for that. Yeah. And so true. Yeah, you know, it is. I, I've seen it, and I'm just speaking from working with so many couples and working both in a one-on-one with couples together or in a general setting. I've said this so many times. I've had I've had these literal, literal words said to me by husbands. It's, it's hard for me because it seems like a weakness act. I mean, a point of weakness. So I, I know that for some cultures, it vulnerability and pride is something that they kind of, this sounds like a, you know, like a redundant here, but it, I think it makes sense. It's something they pride themselves in, that if they have this, this they stay strong, then it's, it makes, it makes them a, a strong guy, right? It doesn't make them, you know, emasculate them or feel like they're, they're weak and they want to appear strong. So pride and, and ego gets in the way. And then once they have, Step over pride and say, okay, I'm going to swallow my pride because what's the alternative? What is it costing me? Then they have to become vulnerable. Now, vulnerability and humility opens the door for risk. Yes, I'm not going to say there's not some risk involved. There is risks involved because it's a risk of rejection, right? It's a risk that this person may not even embrace or entertain the fact that I'm trying to create healing in our relationship. And that's a hard thing. It's a struggle. And I, my heart goes out to a spouse, a husband or a wife who's trying to fix the relationship, heal. I would use the word heal the relationship. And the other person is so stubborn. They don't want to move. They want to prove a point. They want you to suffer. They want you to crawl. They want you to crawl on your knees and on nails and glass. And the, you know, that's an extreme, but they want you to, to, to grovel in the ground to show you how much that you deserve to, to pay that price. And they don't want to accept. But listen, the point is that, yes, it's risky, but he, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? How is it going for you right now? Aren't there some risks involved if things don't change? You remember I said on day number one, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So isn't there some risks, right? Is, aren't there risks at play right now if nothing changes? I, I, yes, there is. There are risks of more hurt and pain and scars. And even, like I mentioned in day number two, opportunities for abuse, physical. Um, I just heard a story recently that really ripped my heart because I know this this father. And what happened, he got the news that his daughter was gunned down, was shot and killed by her husband. And if somebody, I mean, I don't know the daughter, but I know the father. And I began to think about how, how did that happen? Obviously, the relationship she was in there, you know, I don't know the story, but the point is that if nothing changes, nothing changes. Those are some things that can happen when I don't possibly take the risk of doing something that would heal the relationship. Right. And so, yes, it's risky, but I love this quote that I'm going to share with you. And I want you to read it very slowly with me because this is really a very important quote. The quote, the quote is attributed to Leo Buscaglia. Okay. That's his name. I can't pronounce his last name. That's not important, but he says this, the person who risks nothing does nothing has nothing, is nothing, and becomes nothing. He may avoid suffering 
and sorrow, but he simply cannot learn, feel, change, grow, or love. Chained by his certitude, right, or inaction, he is a slave. He has forfeited his freedom. Only the person who risks is truly free. Let me read that again because I think it's so important to understand that, yes, it's, as I mentioned, there is there are risks involved. There is a risk. But here is why a risk have to be taken. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing, and becomes nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he simply cannot learn, feel, change, grow, or love. Chained by his certitude, his inaction, he is a slave. He has forfeited his freedom. Only the person who risks is truly free. Thank you, Tamika. said, so on point. And you're right. It's so on point. Risks must be taken. And every day, here's what I find. Every single day we take risks. Leaving our house is risky, right? Getting out of our bed is risky. How many people have fallen after getting out of bed and, you know, maybe cracked a rib or a hip, especially the older individuals? Or you may slip and slide. Every single day we take risks. So risk is not the issue. The question is the desire. Do I believe that I want this and how bad do I want it? Like I share with you that thing about Jesus and the man who was paralyzed. So risk is a part of the equation and we cannot use that and say, you know, um, it's too risky. Well, my, my question to you is, what is your alternative? What's the alternative? Things stay as they are and run the risks of things getting worse or taking the risk of possibly things getting better. That's a decision you have to make, right? Now, I love this scripture verse in the Bible that says this, God is opposed to the proud. But notice what comes after, but gives grace to the humble. So God is also into this whole thing of saying, hey, I want to give you grace to get healing underway. I want to give you you grace to get your heart healed, your relationship healed, and your spouse's heart healed as well, right? So we then need to then move to how do we go about this? What are some things we need to do? And we need to then request, offer, and accept healing. We need to request it, right? Now, if you were sick, You need to go to the doctor and request the doctor to help you overcome your sickness, right? That doctor is going to offer you a prescription. You have to choose to accept the prescription or not. So the question is, do you want to be healed? So there's a part that we all have to play. We need to be requesting it. We need to accept what's offered to us, right? That is where we've got to start requesting, offering, and accepting healing, okay? Now, um, in day number two, I left you at the end of day number two with this question. What are you responsible for? What's your role? And you wrote down and hopefully had your have your list with you of what you are responsible for from day number two. Again, this list is why I said to you, hang on to the list and bring that list to day number three. So you should have your list of the things you have identified by looking in the mirror of what you are responsible for. What's the role you have played? Small or great, what is the role? Now you have that list. What do you do with that list? Well, I said to hang on to that list because day number three is where we are going to speak about that to some degree. So we've got to accept responsibility. The first thing, after we have the desire and have stepped over um, pride and unwilling to be vulnerable, we have to accept responsibility for our part, right? We're not responsible for what may have happened, what your spouse may have done. We have to respond, be accept responsibility by looking in the mirror. What contribution? What? How did I contribute to um, contribute to what, what has happened? Is there a part that I have to play? Right. Every one of us have to look in the mirror, or need to look in the mirror, if we're going to start healing. Because if we don't look in the mirror, 
and see what the role we have played, it's going to be almost impossible to get healing. Why? Because your spouse, who knows that maybe accepting his or her part, will say, yes, but you also had a part. Now, I'm not saying that's when they, you know, they ought to use that as a weapon, weaponize that and say, yes, you have a part to not take responsibility. No, there's a whole different um, the approach to be one where because of humility, you're going to say, you know what? I played a role in what we, where we're at. I mean, where we're at, we've identified it. We know what's happening. And we've kind of fleshed that out in, in day number two by identifying the disruptive interactions. We've identified that. And when I go back and I look through the lens of what has happened, you know what? Here's what I know I have done. Here's how I know I have re reacted to what you have done. Here's how I have blamed you. Here's how I have also acted in a way that created an environment that led us to where we are. Now, you're not responsible for your spouse's behavior, right? I want to make that clear. You're not responsible for what they did as a result of what happened. You're only saying, I'm responsible for, we talked about that in day number two, whether you were trying to go toe for toe and you disrespected and you call names and you, whatever it is, right? You are responsible for that. Accept that responsibility. Then you have to apologize. Here's where I find many times in relationships where people um, get stuck about apology, right? We want to apologize the way that we want people to apologize to us. So some people, if I say, hey, that's my bad, I'm sorry, they're okay with that, right? But not everybody wants apology that way. So we've got to be the best student of our spouse to see how is it they want apology. And that's why I, I mentioned before that, you know, um, we've been married for 37 years, my wife and I, and I, I said to in day number one that, I'm still learning and she's still learning. Why? Because we go through different stages of life and every stage of our life uh, creates new information, new things in us that we never had before. And so we're trying to figure that out as well. And so we then have to do this constant adjustment, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow in day number four. So that's a whole different topic. But I want to say we have to constantly make adjustment as we go and be okay with that. Apology also have to have content, right? I'm mean, sorry, context. It has to have context. So it's not just content. I'm sorry, that's content. What's the context, right? So apology have to have two things, content and context, right? So you may want to write that in the chat for somebody who's watching to, to just say, hey, apology need to have two things, content and context, right? That's after knowing how your spouse accepts the apology. What is it that he or she wants from you? Is I'm sorry good enough for them? It may be good enough for you, but if it's not good enough for them, you need to present it in a way that makes sense to them, right? We're going to talk more about that in day number four, about making adjustment for these kind of conversations. How do you adjust for these conversations? But an apology is very important. So the content is what you're saying. The context is, what are you apologizing for, right? How often have I heard a person say, I'm sorry, but sorry for what? Sorry for what? Thank you, Carla. See, um, here's a point we're making. We just said apology must have context and content. That's very important. And I just, you know, as I re uh, said that, I wanted to have it shown because you can actually see it on the screen as well. Apology must have context and content. Now. We need to know what are we apologizing for? Because if you hurt me or I hurt you and I say, I'm sorry, my brain, my brain is not fully satisfied because I'm thinking, okay, what are you sorry for? Is it something that happened last week, yesterday, today? What are you sorry for? So we need to provide content, right? What I'm saying, context, what am I sorry for? That is what creates what I call a loop closure. Right, there are three loop closures. I mean, sorry, two loop closures. I'm going to talk about. This is for one of those loop closures. The loop closure is saying, "I apologize." Content. I give context for the apology. That is one thing we have to do. But an apology in of itself is not enough, because you can hear an apology, 
and somehow feel like there's still something left. I've given you content. I've given you context. But you feel like there's still something. And here's where I find many couples don't fully close the big loop. They've closed one small loop, the apology. But the bigger loop is left unclosed. And that is where requesting, offering, and accepting forgiveness comes into play. Now, this is important. I find sometimes when a person offers, you know, when I work with couples um, in in a relationship context, and someone someone will say, they question the nature of the apology. They say, you're not, um, you're not, um, not not only serious, but it's it's, it's not genuine enough. Oh, okay. What makes it genuine? So in their mind, what makes it genuine is possibly how it's said. I'm so sorry. A quiet voice. But who says a quiet voice means it's apology? So I can give you a quiet voice and say, I'm so sorry, I apologize. And you say, oh, that is apology. But my heart may not even, I may have just done it because I know that's what you like. But how do you know that's genuine? So we have this preconceived idea of what apology should look like, right? But here's what the danger of that is. We begin to judge someone's heart. How do I know the person is not genuine? What it is I'm doing is playing God. I'm simply saying, you're not, your heart is not right. Your heart is not behind this. How do I know that? If I don't know your heart and can't see your heart, the only thing I have to accept is your words. That's the only thing I can go by. Yeah, I know words are cheap. I understand that. Words are, you know, um, I, I remember someone says, my, my, uh, my good friends, he was the one who introduced me to this concept. He says, Mouth is m- mouth turned crossway to say anything, right? <laughs> he simply said, "Hey, the reason why your mouth is the way it is, it can say anything, right?" And yes, we can say anything, but if I'm going to heal and create an environment for healing, then I've got to begin to change what hasn't worked, and that is, I have to move away from judgment. And many times, what happened as when someone is offering apology. We step into judgment and we criticize the way they're doing it. And so now they get become defensive and we start a whole different cycle again of conflict over an apology. Imagine a conflict over an apology, which means an apology is meant to solve the conflict and reduce the conflict. And yet we now create another conflict. Does that make sense? Does that, you know, you think about it. That's what makes sense in a relationship. Is it any wonder we keep having this constant conflict? Because we are judging, you know, and and you know very well this this um, which is used so often many times. People use it, um, and they will weaponize this verse of scripture: "Judge not, so you will not be judged." Right? And I get it. I know it's many times used out of context because it continues by saying, "With the same measure you judge, you also will be judged." Are you ready for that? That's the context, the full context of it. Now. So I want you to move away from judgment and trying to play God in the moment because if you're going to heal, you, we have to change some things about the process, right? About what we do, how we behave. The behavior of judgment and criticism is what we do. That is disruptive interactions, right? We don't want to take disruptive interactions into the place of healing. We want to bring something else and be open for healing. And that's why... I want to take time to speak about apology. And then once we've apologized, we then have to request forgiveness. Some people say, okay, I apologize. I said, I'm sorry, right? What more do you want? They'll say, I say, I'm sorry. And then almost like, because they raise their voice now, you're supposed to just accept that. What they forget, what they're simply um, overlooking is that you want, there's something in your heart that says, you know, what I really want for you to hear from you is not just you're sorry, is that you want me to, you want to include me in the whole equation. And how do you include me? By saying to you, would you please forgive me? Would you please forgive me? That is a hard part. That is something I know I had to learn because I grew up in a, not just a culture, but I grew up in a home where that wasn't practiced. I did not hear it. I did not see it. Uh, I, I heard it preached, but I didn't see something like that. Because again, my dad, 
and I'm being Jamaican and our culture. And there's nothing against Jamaican and the culture. It's just where, you know, I'm a part of that. So I can speak about it uh, very well. And my dad never, I never heard my dad ever said, I'm sorry about anything, nothing. Right. And so I grew up that way. And someone here had a very good comment that says, some, I mean, Tamika says, sometimes it's just validating. Yes, you're right. Just validating the hurt, just to know that the person says, but I even say, would you forgive me? It's validating. It's agreeing. Because when we ask God for forgiveness, all we're doing is agreeing with God that what we did is a violation of what his commands are. And we are saying, we're agreeing with you, God. It's wrong. It's sin. Would you forgive me? So that those words of confession, of asking for forgiveness, validates a person and let them know they're not crazy, right? They're not crazy. They are hurt, hurting, and they want you to, to validate that for them. So that, yeah, it's a great point you, you're making there, uh, Tamika. I appreciate that. So not only do you request forgiveness, but you have uh, you've also have to offer forgiveness, right? Offer forgiveness. And then you have to also accept. So it's requesting, offering, and or accepting forgiveness. This is so essential if we're going to have healing. And that is me. I have to be open to receive. So if a person says, would you forgive me? I can say, you know, can I get back to you on that? And I don't have to say yes right away. It doesn't mean I'm not open to forgiveness. But if you are in a relationship and you have mutually, uh, mutually agreed that, I may request forgiveness, but I want you to, to not answer right away. I want you to think about it, pray about it, reflect on it, and then give me your answer. Unless you know that when you give your answer, yes, I'll forgive you, you truly mean it, then you can. But it's okay to say, can I just get back to you in an hour? I know I want to, and I'm willing to forgive you, but can I just sit on this and just make, just ex exhale? This is healthy kind of, and we talk more about that in um, day number four, about adjusting. This is kind of adjusting to a new way of doing things, right? But there has to be a, a, an offering of forgiveness if it's requested. Now, here's what I think some people have a, also a hard time. They'll say, well, if I forgive, does, does, that mean, does that mean I have to forget? No one says you ought to forget. Nowhere do we find that's also part of the equation. Because if you are going to ever forget a hurt, that means you have to either have amnesia or God have to do a miracle, right? Now, the question is, can you, over time, have that offense be so um, become so blurred because you've moved away from it that you can, you're very hard, you're hard to remember it? Yes, yes. You, over time, it can become almost like a blur in the background. You can't even recall all the details. You move so far away from it, you don't have even that as a fresh memory because you're truly forgiven. And here is where you know that you're forgiven. You're forgiving that person. If you forgive that person, right, because you remember it doesn't mean you haven't forgiven, right? You remember it because you're human. But when you remember it, you don't bring it up, right? When you truly forgive, you do not bring that up with your spouse again. Because if and when you bring that up, that means you truly had not forgiven that person. And there's a whole different teaching on that that I call forgiveness because forgiveness is a gift. And that's why I wrote a book. I wrote a book on that because it's a true, a whole teaching on that. And I won't take, you know, it could take me all night to go through that whole process. But just understand that this is what happens in this transaction called forgiveness, right? So there's requesting, offering, and accepting forgiveness. Now, once you have started the healing process, it's wonderful that you begin to heal, but then what's so important is you need to know where to go from here. Does that make sense, right? You can heal, but you need to go from here. Someone asked a question, what if it still hurts? And I'll, I'll come back to that question if I can at the end. What if it still hurts? Great question. I'll come back to that um, again, and the person said, oh, that's why you bring it up because it still hurts. Well, yes, and um, but let me answer this question here in context since I'm here. Um, yes, it still hurts, but when the hurt comes, if you're forgiven, then you have to now regulate your emotions and tell your emotions basically, no, you're not the master of me. 
I have forgiven you, my, my spouse, and I'm going to uh, manage my emotions in a way where I don't let it have, I love this, um, understand the quote. He says, don't let it be the boss of you, right? So you have to now work hard and be intentional and consciously when you feel the hurt, tell the hurt moments you're feeling that, yes, I'm hurt. However, I made a decision to forgive and I'm going to walk in forgiveness, right? So bringing it up, it simply means you didn't forgive. Feeling the hurt doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. It's because it's really you were hurt, but you're going to constantly remind yourself over and over and over. And you may have to do it 10, 15, 20, 100 times a day if it's what it takes. Because you have said to yourself, I made a decision to forgive. And once I made a decision to forgive, I'm a person of my word. I'm going to honor my word. Right? So if you're not ready to forgive, that you shouldn't say yes. And and here's the problem, though. If you are a follower of Christ, you have no option but to say yes because we're told to forgive. But it doesn't mean you won't feel it. You won't hurt. You won't have the sting of it. There's nothing that says you won't have those. And that's why I say I could teach a whole night on forgiveness because these are the questions that comes up many, many times. And this is a great um, statement here. Healing takes time. Yes, healing takes takes time. You know, I I prefer, I prefer that statement, which I make many times, because most times we will hear, oh, time heals all wounds. That's not true. That's not true. You could have all the time given to you and the wound still there. But here's what I know. Healing takes time. Whatever that looks like, it takes time. And you should only be the one that pastures yourself. No one should rush you. No one should tell you should get over it by now. That's not how healing takes place, right? Imagine you have a cut and it's, you know, it's not yet healed. Oh, get over that by now. It should be healed. What do you mean? My body heals different from yours. And it, for you, it may be overnight. For me, maybe two or three days or two or three weeks. I have to know what healing is like for me and let that be what I, I um, operate by. So you have to design the future. What do you want instead of what you had? Some people will say, I want our relationship to go back to what it was. Really? Really? Isn't it what it was that led to where you are? So as much as you would like, you know, the former days, I love the, the, um, the, the Bible verse that says, forget the former days. Why? Because the former days may not be as beautiful or as exciting as you truly think it was. When you were in it, it seems that way. But I can tell you, it's part of that that led to where you are. To the disruptive interactions is how it was. So I say you may want to take some good things from there if you want to design to design your future. But I'm telling you, I'm saying you don't want to take everything from your past to design your future. You want to be able to sit down and have a vision. What do you want now the future to look like, right? And I'm going to just barely touch on that because Day number four is where we're truly going to design the future. But just suffice it to say, what you want to do is set up rules of engagement. You want to outline a preferred future. But whatever you do at this stage, this is the most important thing I'll say about this just for today. And that is you want to put guardrails in place. Why guardrails? Well, I'll give you a quick, a quick story here. I remember a time in Jamaica many years ago when I used to live there. And this is, you know, going back to a long, long time. But I remember one time we were driving in a car. My friend, he was driving. And there was four of us in the car. We we're going down a very steep cliff, you know, very winding cliff and uh, road. I'm sorry, a road that had cliffs were on either side. If you've ever driven in the Caribbean, especially, say, in Jamaica um, and parts of Haiti, which I've driven as well, too, especially up in the mountain, you are get, the road is so close to the edge. You can actually look out your vehicle and look over the cliff and like you go, oh, what am I doing up here? So you don't look over the cliff. Just keep on driving. So here's the point. Don't look over the cliff. Just keep on driving because if you look over the cliff, you could have a heart attack and pass out. So just keep on driving. So this, while we were driving that night down this winding path, winding road, the person who was driving, he wasn't familiar with the road. And the car went too close to the edge and we began. We 
it clipped the edge and we began to roll over. There was no, there were no guardrails on, on the road, just a very, you know, and the car rolled a full roll. So it rolled to the side, to the top, to the side and back on the four wheels. And thank God, some brushes kept us from keep on rolling down the cliff. And the car landed on the four wheels, windshields all crashed, I mean, broken up and the glass broken up. But thank God, other than some cuts and bruises, we were, we came out safe. God protected us. And here's a crazy thing. I really wasn't even living for, living for God as I, you know, now do back then. But God knew all of that. He knew the, the beginning, the end, and the present. And so what saved us was those brushes. Of course, God did, but I'm just saying the car from keep on spinning down the hill. If they had guardrails, the chance if the car would not go over and we would have been protected from that. Many times in our relationships, we don't have the guardrails set up. We'll talk more about that in day number four, what those guardrails could be and should look like. Because once you, whatever rules of engagement you come up with, that how you have, you want for a preferred future, Right. You're designing what the future should look like because you're now healed and is healing. Then you want to put in place guardrails first, guardrails. Because in day number two that we did about disruptive in, in interactions, they were not guardrails set up. It's almost like every man, every woman for her, his own, her own, right? Just do as you please. And so guardrails is one of the first thing you want to put in place. What are guardrails? It's just the protections that are going to keep you from going over the cliff in your relationship. In day number two, what happened because of the pain and the wound and the insecurities, you went over the cliff, right? You went beyond. People people just begin to hurt each other. And it's almost like, you know, you keep on having this keep up, 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 up the ante. And it gets just, I mean, worse and worse and worse because there's no guardrails to stop the spin of the car going down the cliff and all you're hearing is crashing all around you in the relationship. But what if there's guardrails? It would keep the car, like in my case, from going over the guardrails, right? And we're going to talk more about that on day number four. Now, we want to come back as we're kind of going for the landing here. Remember, all we've covered so far today is what needs to happen between the number you choose and the next number you are you want to get to. That's your preferred future. The next number is your preferred future. What do you want to see happening in your preferred future? Now, it's not that it's going to be you get there and stop. No, as you can see, the number in our example is six. Our preferred future is seven because that's doable. It's manageable. It's small bites. We want to take what we want to, you know, yes, we want a big picture from six to nine or, you know, yes, but we have to go one step at a time. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, with one step. And so the one step is where we have all we talked about in day number three, this day right here is what is is going to take us to the next level. That's all we need to build momentum, to feel like we have a win, to feel like our relationship is now breathing. That's all we're looking for. Right. And it's what it is we've talked about today. And here's my question as I had the question for you that I have um, is this. What is the first action? What's the first action you need to take for your marriage to heal? What is the first action you need to take for your marriage to heal? Think about that for a second. What is the first action you need to take for your marriage to heal? right? I would like for you to journal that. I would like for you to think about that, write that down in your um, workbook, or if you have a book you're working on, write that down, pray about it, journal that. Remember again, as I said in day number two, you're only responsible for your actions and your response to other people's actions. That's all you're responsible for. So what is the first action you need to take for your marriage to heal? Okay, look in the mirror. Now, here's a homework assignment. I want you to write down what is the first thing that needs to change? Now, there's two different questions. The question here is for you. What is the first action you need to take, right? 
this homework assignment is what is the first thing that needs to change in your relationship to create an environment for healing? What's the first thing that needs to change? And you can post that. You can write that down. But this is very important. These two questions are very important. I want to challenge you on that. What is the first action you need to take? Right? That you need to take. You're responsible for. And what is the first thing that needs to change in your relationship to create an environment for healing? Okay? Why is it so important? Because day number four, which is our des- our next um our next day's um challenge, is going to deal with this idea adjusting for deeper connection. What we have just done is set the stage. Now we're going to do, do the adjustment for deeper connection, right? So when I ask the question about what is the first action and also what is the first thing that needs to change, why is that so important? Because it sets the stage for adjusting. How do we adjust? What kind of adjustment do I need to do for deeper connection? That is what we truly want, right? We want to be happier. We want to have more intimacy. We want to have feel like we're heard. We want to feel supported. That's what deeper connection is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about in day number four. That's tomorrow. And there you have it, my friends. I hope this episode encouraged you and gave you some hope. This podcast is designed with that in mind, and each week we seek to find one more way to get you closer to your heart's desire when it comes to your marriage. Make sure you give this show a rating and a review by clicking the appropriate link that will take you there on the platform you're listening to, and also subscribe to the show so you'll be updated on all new releases. Remember, if you're interested in the full course, which consists of five videos, you can access it at kingsleygrant.com slash HMS course. And the link will be in the show notes as well, right? And I'm inviting you to join me on a live webinar on Thursday, October 13th at 8 p.m. But you only have one last chance to register for it, my friends. As you know, this episode is only a couple of days prior to the webinar. So make sure you Click the link that's will be in the show notes. And if you uh, don't go there, here's a link right here. It's kingsleygrant.com slash webinar. How much simpler could that be? kingsleygrant.com slash webinar. And this web, this link will also be in the show notes as I mentioned, mentioned it today, mentioned it just now. So don't delay, my friend. Do it today. It will only take you less than two minutes for the for the review and rating and less than 60 seconds to register for the webinar. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He, you know his peace and his love both now and forever for you and your spouse in your marriage. That's my prayer for you. May God bless you. Until next time, I'll see you then. Take care. God bless.